Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Eye on Africa. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the African Studies Center at Michigan State University. And Eye on Africa is our weekly seminary series. I'm very happy today to have Professor Oyoumi as our guest speaker. Before I pass it on to her, a brief introduction. In 2021, Professor Oyomi won the Distinguished Africanist Prize of the African Studies Association. Each year, the African Studies Association presents the Distinguished Africanist Award to a member of the association who has made extraordinary contributions to the field. Oyomi is a professor of sociology, gender, and African studies at Stony Brook University. Educated at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, and University of California at Berkeley, she is the author of two monographs and four anthologies. Her book, The Invention of Woman, Making an African Sense of Western Gender Discourses, won the 1980 Distinguished Book Award in the Gender and Sex Section of the American Sociological Association. Her latest co-edited anthology is titled Naming Africans on the Epistemic Value on African Names. And I think she's going to talk about that because the title of the talk today is What is Not in a Name on the Epistemic Value of African Names. Thank you so much for being here, Professor Yomi. Thank you so much, Ms. Sar and everyone here. And good day to everyone. I know people are joining from different parts of the world. But let me privilege where I am, <laughs> which is normal. So I am in my office at Stony Brook. And if you look behind me, you can see books and books all over the place. But good day to everyone. My name is Oyeronke Oyewumi. And I am doing this since this presentation is about naming. And in a global world today, as we see it, as we move around the world, you discover that not many people can pronounce your name properly, <laughs> maybe except your mother. But that should be normal. What we're looking for is people to make an effort, a good faith effort to pronounce the names. And I don't accept when many Africans say things like, well, you know, I changed my name to Mary because nobody could pronounce <laughs> my name. I want to say, do you know how to pronounce Mary? From the perspective of Westerners, you have an accent. So please stick with your name. And that's what we all must do. Much of the presentation will be drawn from our newly published anthology naming Africans on the epistemic value of African names. This anthology is co-edited with Herwan Girma of University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and there are eight other contributors. And I want to appreciate the work that went into it. And I salute my co-authors. In the first part of the presentation, I will take the liberty of sharing with you some of the ideas from some of the chapters randomly selected, just to give you a flavor of the work and the, the contributions that various scholars have made. The authors are from nine countries. The entries include Uganda, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Namibia, Kenya, and Ethiopia. My one regret, and I, and I have to say it here, I'm always saying it. My one regret is that there's no chapter on Zimbabwe. And anybody who knows me knows that I just find the Shona naming system especially so fascinating. And I tried my very best to get uh, a scholar from Zimbabwe to make a contribution. And what is so interesting is that some of the scholars I, I approached had names like advice, 
intelligence, reason, brilliance. <laughs> so that was all the more reason that I wanted what I call my Zimbabwe chapter. But unfortunately, I, we weren't able to get that. But Zimbabwe is not totally absent because in parts of our introduction, we brought in the book, the novel, We Need New Names. And that novel does a great job of representing some of the issues about naming in Zimbabwe. So all is not totally lost. So in the first part of this presentation, let me just give you a flavor of some of the um, contribu contributions. The great South African intellectual and anti-apartheid activist, Archie Mafeje asked, what forms of accumulated knowledge do Africans have and how do we get at it? This question or a variation of it has always been and uh, always animated my research and informs this project. Indeed, one of the issues that bedevil scholars of Africa is how to identify sources of knowledge about endogenous original African institutions, cosmologies, and epistemologies against the background of the oft repeated but erroneous idea that African communities did not have indigenous writing traditions until Europeans came, as is often cryptically stated. The error is compounded by the almost exclusive use of written sources to access ancient or accumulated knowledge anywhere in the world. Although archeology, span paleontology, and ancient art have been recruited to shed light on, light on the human past, everyday sources of information such as language, names and naming practices have not been systematically mined enough. So our quest in this collection was indeed to use names as archi archival sources. African societies have creatively embedded in personal names a wealth of information. For instance, in certain African societies, personal names can provide information ranging from a commentary on the experiences surrounding society to an evocation of a desired outcome. The African experience invites a rephrasing of Shakespeare's what's in a name to one that is what is not in a name, because it seems as if African communities have embedded everything, almost, in naming. Names are not just creative linguistic expressions. They constitute valuable sources of historical and ethnographic documentation. In this regard, contemporary African names are instructive indicators of westernization, Christianization, and Islamization of communities, three entwined processes that in recent history have had a profound impact on peoples on the continent. Lest we forget, scholar Maureen Ikiotwonye reminds us that the naming and renaming of conquered people, conquered spaces, and the subsequent naming and renaming of the bodies that occupy those spaces is an important mechanism of the planetary and more recently interplanetary colonial matrix of power. The modern colonialist tendency to comprehensively name and rename places under their domination has its roots in the long 16th century and Europe's quest to conquer and dominate the world permanently. We see this theme echoed in quite a number of the papers in this collection. So the first person I need to talk about is the paper by, by linguist, sociolinguist Bertrand Ngo Ngijo Banum's 
paper entitled Engendering Personal Names in Basa Culture from the Origins to the Epic Tradition and Beyond. Basa communities are located in Cameroon. The essay addresses two important questions. How are Basa names created and how is gender embodied in these names? To answer this question, Bertrand Banum explores the genealogies of Vasa ancestors and the foundational epic of Keton. These Vasa Cameroonian traditions showcase naming practices and patterns with deep roots in people's cultural heritage beyond the et ethnographic and linguistic descriptions they provide the names of Basa founding parents and protagonists in the cultural epic consistently underscore the significance of gender and the diminution of women is exposed in this epic tradition. In a further elaboration of the richness and complexities of African naming systems and their intersections with gender classification, we turn to Mata Ndakala Kobanikov's paper titled, What's in a Namesake? The Inbushi and Gender in Owambo Naming Practices in the Purple Violets of Oshantu. The Owambo people are to be found in Namibia. Ndakalako Banikov expounds on the gender legacies of colonization and Christianity amongst the Owambo people of Namibia. For example, women taking up their husband's names was one of these colonial legacies. Reclaiming Owambo personal names during the struggle for independence was a form of resistance to colonialism and an expression of cultural reawakening. Another common naming practice among the Owambo was namesaking, known as Imbushi relationship. Grounding her discussion on the novel, The Purple Violet of Oshantu, Ndakala Kobanikov uncovers the complexities of namesaking. Namesakes not only create a link in kinship networks, but reflect the belief that when people share a name, they inhabit the same personhood. Therefore, in addition to memorializing significant people, namesaking imposes social ties with sometimes conflicting obligations. In the paper, Mother Agency and the Currency of Names, Bessi Muhonja examines the question of power and the privilege of naming and its significance for identity creation, destiny affirmation, legacy establishment, lineage and community belonging among the Maragoli of Western Kenya. Drawing from extensive research and her own personal cultural experiences, Muhonja discusses processes of renaming, denaming, negative naming, and the performativity of names to indicate belonging. Within the patrilineal and patrilocal Maragoli community, she situates the influence of motherhood and the authority of women, particularly paternal grandmothers in naming customs, including the power to withhold a name, thus denying admission into the family lineage. Then Kwesi Konedu in Akan Names as Archives of Indigenous Knowledge provides us with historical perspective on the ubiquitous use of the patterns, what they call day names, but Kwesi Konadu reminds us that it is, uh, these names are actually soul names, but we know them as popular day names in Ghana and even here in the diaspora. Arguing against the emphasis on colonial disruptions, Konedu narrates the story of Ajwa, one of the earliest documented day names in the historical archives. 
to highlight historical continuities as evidence in personal name. Apparently, the name Ajwa, which is a female day name, is was found in a 1572 Portuguese document. Kwesi Konedu advances three interrelated perspectives that can be gained through the study of Akan and more generally African names. Paying attention to names as archives of historicized knowledge, highlighting historical continuities through the epistemology of names and offering new pathways to cultural and historical knowledge. Finally, before I go on to my work, let me talk about another one of our contributors, Florida Kuhanga Antonio Tello, in her essay, Tell Me Your Name and I Will Tell You Who You Are, The Construction of Names in Angola and the Colonial Influence. In this paper, she discusses the changes in processes of naming over a broad historical period among the Bakongo ethnic group of Northern Angola. She tells us that naming of children was based on criteria for the maintenance of family history and or ethnicity. Prior to the advent of Catholicism and the introduction of Portuguese as the official colonial language, the practice of bestowing names inherited from ancestors, which ensured the transmission of history and lineage was widespread. Colonialism, however, disrupted this and other traditions by imposing, among other things, bureaucratic barriers to the use of indigenous non portuguese the, the devaluing of traditional naming practices, which is most evident in the official registries began in the colonial era, continued almost unchallenged in post-independence Angola, where local names are still deemed inferior. The interventions of the Catholic Church and problematic legal requirements, such as the use of Portuguese names in official registries are therefore shown to be detrimental to the national multi-ethnic identity and culture. We learn from Florita Tello that today, even today in Angola, one is not allowed to have more than one African name. So if your first name is African, your last name has to be Portuguese. And if your first name is Portuguese, then you are allowed to have an African name. And this is from an independent African nation. Some of what this also reminds me of is the story of how Nelson Mandela got his name. When he went to school, as has been documented, Nelson was not a part of of his name. But when he introduced himself at a very young age to a teacher at school, I think it was a Miss Ding Dingani, who when he said his name was Rolihala, she said, no, that is not acceptable. Your name will be Nelson. It seems as if this, this theme is echoed again and again in different communities. Now I turn to my own work. What I'll be presenting this afternoon, some of it is from the book, but this goes beyond the book because it was actually my examination of Yoruba names and praise names that led me to initiate the process of having a, 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 an Africa-wide collection on the same theme. My presentation, the subset of my pre presentation is titled, To Gender or Not to Gender? That is the question in investigating Yoruba praise names. 
for a start, let me pose the question, what is gender? I am a gender scholar, so this is important to me, especially as the concept of gender has come under all sorts of pressure in recent times. What is gender? Simply put, gender is a system of classification, which for hundreds of years at least has been presented as if it is inherent in the organization of human communities everywhere, gender was presented as universal. But if any of you know anything about my work, my book, The Invention of Women, was one of the first to totally challenge that idea that gender is universal, that gender is inherent in human organization, as I showed that in Yoruba society of Southwest Nigeria, on, that until recently in history, gender was not ontological or original to the systems of classification. So what I hope to do in the next few minutes is to bring that whole question of to gender or not to gender Yoruba practices, in this case, most specifically, naming to the, to, to the whole issue of gender and gendering and the meaning of gender in the world we live in today. Traditionally, Yoruba names are not gender specific in that both males and females bore the same names. This is not unusual in Africa. Many parts of the, the continent, people have names that cross crosses both male and female. Yoruba names and naming are no different from other social institutions, all of which expose an epistemology that does not construct gender. Hence, I, as I have established in various publications over the years, there were no gendered moral and social at attributes in the cultural ethos. And so notions of masculinity or femininity, femininity are absent. Or we're absent because we're also taking into consideration the colonial impact. However, in the 19th century, Oriki, and here I'm referring to a personal phrase name, a particular kind of name appeared and appeared to be gendered and came into wide use. Such name seems to be gender specific in the sense that today in popular understanding, a particular set of oriki are associated with the female body and another parallel one are male identified. Gendered names at any level do not fit, do not fit in with the already existing variety of names in Yoruba culture. Neither do Oriki conform to the logic of Yoruba naming practices, world sense or social institution. The apparent identification of Oriki with one body type and another group of Oriki names with another body type is anomalous in Yoruba culture. So it becomes a curiosity, a puzzle to explain why Oriki names, phrase names, would be the exception in terms of Yoruba institutions, Yoruba uh, kinship categories, Yoruba practices, which are generally non-gender specific. So my objective is to understand and to explain whether Oriki names, the praise names, are gendered. And if they are, how are they gendered? When did they become gendered? And how do we understand this institution of names within the larger Yoruba culture? That's why the fact that 
the female oriki and male oriki are thought of as a gender field of the same phenomenon. Analysis of the meanings of the names suggests the two sets of names develop differently. My analysis did not take only the gender nature, nature of personal phrase names for granted. Recognizing that their apparent use currently in a gendered fashion may be a result of change over time. Theoretically, the question of whether a particular practice or institution is gendered can be apprehended at two levels. First, gender is routinely invoked when the phenomenon under study is seen to superficially attach to male and female bodies differently and in a binary way. The second level of gender is more fundamental in that it speaks to the gender division of social and moral attributes that is embedded in the ethos, which is then perceived to be expressed in social practices throughout. In Western societies, whose morals and values overly inform academic discussions of gender, the two levels are conflated because of the degree to which gender construction have become the warp and the woof of the culture. However, in Yoruba society, because gender as a construct is not ontological, gender as a construct is not original to the Yoruba ethos, and since any articulation of gender is a new development historically, the multi-level process of understanding gender becomes obvious. Thus, a study of gendering in Yoruba affords scholars the opportunity to understand the process by which institutions and practices become gendered. Does the presence of the first level, that is the superficial naming of male bodies and female bodies, differently, automatically signal the presence in the society of gendered moral attributes. The evidence from Yoruba society does not support this line of thinking. Because social and moral attributes are still not understood to inherit in males and females differently. Let me explain this more clearly. In Western society, strength is particularly associated with males, especially physical strength. If men are, because of the binary nature of gender, if men are strong, then women are weak, or at least women are less strong. I am saying that what we understand and what we understood from the Yoruba dispensation is that this was not the case. For example, some of the fiercest, strongest female um, deities in the Yoruba dis dispensation are actually female deities. For example, the deity Oya is, as, is regarded as a fierce and as strong as Shango, the deity of thunder. That gendering, that type of Western binary and gendering and reducing women to weakness did not occur originally in the Yoruba dispensation. Today might be a different case and we can talk about that. The ultimate question in any discussion of origins of gender constructs in Yoruba society really is not whether Yoruba thought recognizes differences between male and female bodies, but whether it recognizes social and moral attributes as feminine or masculine, and as a result, organize social facts to express such a belief. Another illustration of this is that when you are looking at naming in the West, in English, for example, it's not likely that a man would be named after a flower. For example, rose. 
because there's this notion that when you look at, <laughs> at a rose, what you see is femininity. It's just ingrained and it's very much a part of the culture. People may be trying to change it, but these ideas were ingrained. I can't think of any Yoruba name that has femininity or masculinity ingrained in it. Even a name like Ewa, beauty, in Yoruba, it is not limited to women. So I'm interested in praise names, Oriki, for what they can tell us about history and social change. One of the most fascinating things about indigenous names is what one scholar calls their record keeping function. According to anthropologist Niyi Akinaso, and I quote, Yoruba personal names serve as an open diary by providing a system through which information is symbolically stored and retrieved. The diary is open because personal names are public, being the primary mode of address among the Yoruba. However, the nature and the range of information stored in a given personal name may not be known to every member of the community. Since personal names are used several times a day in the normal course of an individual's life routine, this diary keeping function is particularly effective in serving as a reminder of those dominant social values, important personal concerns, and other special events, end of quote. Yoruba names can be literally read for information. And it is this archival function that attracted me to the idea of using personal names to probe gender issues and to gather knowledge. There are different kinds of Yoruba names, many different kinds. However, unlike any other indigenous name type, Oriki phrase names are today gender specific in that male and female names seem to be distinguishable. No other Yoruba names, whether primary or whatever, have gender associations. The seniority based system, which I have discussed in other parts of my work, the seniority based system of social hierarchy is manifested in naming. And uh, a great example of that is in the naming of twins. Yoruba twins are named based on the twin who came second and the twin who came out first. But in this instance, it's inverted. In this regard then, uh, uh, gender, the apparent gender Oriki names, are they the exception to this idea that the Yoruba did not dichotomize their world? That was one of the, 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 the questions that animated me as I looked at Oriki. I am curious as to how and why Oriki appear to be gender specific. Against this background, I ask questions about what is the origin of the praise name? Why are they seemingly gender specific? What do these names tell us about social change? And what do these names tell us about gender? Although some of the earlier Yoruba scholars had presented Oriki as gendered, even though he agreed that Yoruba names in general are not gender specific. Unfortunately, he did not try to explain why he said Uriki names are gendered. So when we do an analysis of the names themselves, what do we find? What we find is that the so-called female Uriki name 
names seem to be stock names and they are so similar. Let me give you some of the Oriki names. Oriki names are very uh, identifiable. You don't, you, you usually don't mix them with any other kind of name. They have a pattern. They are trisyllabic. That's what linguists will say. And a few of them, Anike, my own praise name is Anike. There's Ashake. And if you listen to Afrobeat, you'll see that one of the most popular Afrobeat musician today is called Ashake, which is supposed to be a, a female identified name. But from him, we learned that that was his mother's name, which he adopted, which is also interesting. So we have so-called female Oriki names like Anike, Ashake, Aduke, Ashabi, Awero, Amokwe, Ajoke, Abebi. But what is interesting about the female identified name is that what they emphasize is the preciousness of the child and the need to love, cherish, and pamper this offspring. They are terms of endearment. They are terms of affection. What is the hope of the parent of Aduke? That everyone the individual encounters should compete to cherish them. Is this not the hope of all parents for their children, male and female? My own Oriki Anike means one who we cannot but love. So that a cursory look at female identified names will show that most of them contain the verb ke, as even in my first name, Oyeronke, ke in Yoruba is a verb meaning to love, to cherish. On the basis of such inventory, one might conclude that the verb ke has been feminized. Such thinking would be an error because there are many primary names that also contain the verb ke, which are not limited to males and females. With so with regard to female associated names, it's about loving the child, it's about cherishing the child, and it seems as if all those names are actually one name in, 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 vari in variable, presented in variable ways. With regard to the meaning of male associated name, however, a different scenario a different scenario becomes apparent. Unlike the female ones, the meaning of the male associated names are varied and seem more often to include verbs of agency. For example, Ajamu, one who fights and triumphs. Ajani, one who fights and gets what he's fighting for. Ijan Yoruba is to fight. With regard to the female identified Oriki, the name suggests we are told what others should do with the child. But in regard to male Oriki, we are told that these names have more to do with the characteristics of the child. Samuel Johnson claimed that names express parents' gendered expectations for children is not borne out when we analyze the meanings of the names. My guess is that contemporary writers are living in an age dominated by Western Judeo-Christian and Islamic cultures in which gendered names are normative. Steeped in Western intellectual theories, many Yoruba scholars are not attuned to Yoruba traditional name, norms, and so, and some may have a certain investment in promoting male superiority of present day global culture. As far as I know, I am the first person to raise question, as, questions as to why Oriki are gender specific 
in a universe of Yoruba names and Yoruba practices that do not encode gender. The de deconstructing the meanings of the names and discovering that there's nothing intrinsic in them that expresses femininity or masculinity immediately suggests that the gender associations are tied to usage. In fact, the parental desires they express are equally applicable to males and females. Scholar K. Yusuf seems to be the exception in that he addressed the issue of gender and Uriq in his writing. I cannot agree more with this linguist who concluded that there is nothing in the linguistic and semantic structure of Uriki that distinguishes it as feminine or masculine. that Oriki acquired gender association mainly from usage. Two scholars disagree with his finding. What is also obvious from the analysis of the pattern and meanings of the names is that female Oriki and male Oriki are so different that they appear not to have the same origin, which suggests that they may have developed for dissimilar purposes. It is my contention, therefore, that despite the fact that the female and male praise names have become coupled in everyday use and are treated as if they emerge together by most scholars, I aver that they have different histories and may have had nothing to do with each other originally. The majority of names in the genre are associated with females because the female Oriki names are truly praise names and define the category. I believe that females, female associated name emerged as a distinct category. Female praise names, despite their numbers and apparent variety, all express the same thing, the desire that the child be cherished by all. Strictly speaking, not all male Oriki are praise names. They are varied in meaning and do not necessarily ref refer to the characteristics of the child. It is on that basis then, I concluded that the question is not whether Oriki names are gender specific. The question is how these two sets of names became coupled and subsequently labeled as gendered name. Earlier on, in, this, in the constructing the meanings of Riki, it became clear that the female associated set of name and the male ad identify one arose differently. I pointed out that the most important question to ask me be how the two sets of names became coupled rather than whether they express gender specificity or not because it is the coupling of the two sets of name, names rather than anything else that led to the idea that they are gender specific. The preponderant number of Orikia female associates, thus it became important to examine the origin. And in examining the origin of female Oriki, which defines the genre, I came to the conclusion in my research that the female associated Oriki developed as part of a new genre of poetry called Ekunyawu. And Ekunyawu just means bridal chant. A bridal chant, chant performed on the eve of the bride's departure to join her husband's family. These names were original, originally a result of self-naming. They are one nickname in a constellation of appellations that brides gave themselves when they performed the bridal chant as they prepared to move to the husband's family compound at the completion of marriage rites. Marriage in Yoruba land at this period became patrilocal.
meaning the new couple moved in with the family of the groom. The Ekunyawo performance, the bridal, the bridal chant, is a study in lamentation that borrows liberally from linear poetry in order to make its point. The fact that, okay, because the names are terms of endearment, they seem to be designed to comfort, to pacify, to soothe, and elevate the mood of the subject. In a sense, they are also prayers. So these were names, alake, aduke, that brides gave themselves as they walked around the town, lamenting the fact that they were moving away from home. They were in lamentation because this was an anxiety reading period for the bride, a time during which the bride is wondering whether she would be loved in the home of her parents-in-law the same way she is loved at home. That is why she, as she performed the bridal chant, her distress is palpable. She questions why she must make the transition from her natal home to her husband's home. The lamentation of the bride is a day-long performance, often accompanied with weeping, that the young woman stages on the day before she is to leave her natal compound for her husband's house. The purpose is to express her feelings about this impending change of state from child to adult, and most significantly, to a prospective mother from a permanent omoile to ayale. The impending change of residence from her natal lineage to her husband fills her with anxiety. Questions are more anxiety reading questions. The anxiety and uncertainty are a result of the fact that the bride is moving from a known and predictable home in the bosom of her loving parents into an unknown world of strangers who remain unpredictable. So during this bridal chance, she gives herself names like Anike, one whom one must love, Ajoke, one whom everybody must cherish, Aduke, one whom everybody must compete to love. This was a way of invoking her own ori and praying that as she moved to the husband's house, that the love of her family and parents would follow her. And I believe that's where these names came from. The so-called female oriki names are bridal names that emerged from marriage rites. To reiterate my argument, female oriki originated as names that brides gave themselves as they made the transition from their natal home to their marital home at a time in which patrilocality, that is, moving into the husband's family home, became institutionalized as the dominant mode of marriage residence in Oyo Yoruba society. Thus, I submit that Oriki were originally names taken by brides as they anticipated the change in residence from their natal to marital home, a change that in many cases involved movement to a different town. So the bridal chant performance encapsulates the meaning of marriage. Today, the defining characteristics of Yoruba marriage for females is closely tied to marriage residence. But the question then is, how did Oriki names for males develop? And what is the relationship between these set of male names and female names? Oriki names 
anticipated the challenges of modernity when many people, male and female, had to leave original homes for marriage, for work, for school, and the like. And all could use an oriki name like Aduke, Anike, Ashake, an invocation that suggests that even when one is among strangers, one should be loved and cared for. In that sense, then, even males could use the so-called female oriki name. It may be that the creative brides who first gave such names to themselves extended these phrase names to their children, given the beauty and the wonderful sentiments expressed by the names. What is not to like? Oriki names are beautifully appealing. Lineage oriki performed by mothers constituted lullaby for children, and it would not be surprising in that context that they spread. They spread these beautiful names that spoke of love and caring. It is also plausible that once it became institutionalized as one of the names given at the naming ceremony, it was extended to male children. And that is why indeed unisex oriki, because indeed there was another third set of oriki called that have been described as non-gender and names such as akoke and adufe may not be exceptional, but a reflection of a period during which these names were given to both male and female children. There would be nothing unusual about this since the vast majority of Yoruba names were never gender associated and still remain gender neutral to this day. All this is a testament to the fact that the sentiments expressed in these names are universal, a sign that social and moral attributes still largely betray no gender association. What about male oriki? I will not go into the discussion of male oriki here, but you can ask because time is gone. And there's one more thing I want to do that I think is interesting. The impacts and influence of Christianity and Islam on Yoruba naming practices also had an effect on Oriki names. How does Islam and Christianity come into Yoruba naming systems? Yoruba society is an in interesting society in much of Africa. Not because, not just because we have Muslims and Christians in the society, many societies have that. But in Yoruba land, we almost have equal numbers of Christians and Muslims. So the society becomes a wonderful lab for studying and differentiating the impact of Christianity and the impact of Islam on Yoruba people. In the 19th century, the new, new Yoruba converts to both Islam and Christianity had a similar problem. And the problem that they thought they had that motivated their naming practices was this idea that Yoruba names, indigenous Yoruba names were hiddenish. What does that mean? Because many Yoruba names had a prefix attached to these names from the beginning. And many of these prefixes venerated Yoruba deities. For example, my name, Oye Ronke, Oye is a prefix. And I'm sure you found other Ronkes. Other Ronkes could be Ade Ronke, or La Ronke, and the like. But those prefixes change. In earlier times more so, somebody could be Oguronke. Ogu is the deity of iron. And if it's a deity that is worshipped in the family, then 
Ogun would prefix many of the names in that family. They would be Ogun Ronke, Ogun Femi, Ogun Kukule, and Ogun would be it. So but for both Yoruba Muslims and Christians, they no longer wanted to be identified with Yoruba deities or spirituality. So one of the first things that the Christians did was to move away from Yoruba names. But that was not totally acceptable to them because over time they saw that they needed to still have Yoruba names. So what they did was to change the prefixes in those names and remove the names of the deities. So instead of Ogunronke, you would become Aderonke, Olaronke, because Ade means crown, Ola means honor, and apparently to them did not have anything to do with Yoruba deities. That was the solution for the Christians. For the newly converted Yoruba Muslims, they too saw a problem with indigenous Yoruba names. But first and foremost, in Islam, it was not acceptable. The Muslim community did not tolerate substituting Yoruba names for Muslim names if converts were to be regarded as true Muslims. In places like Ibadan, Oyo, and Lagos, where there were recognizable communities of Muslims, the adoption of Islamic names as first names became standard and universal. These names in these Yoruba communities today are called Sunna, a new word introduced to the Yoruba lexicon. I speak Hausa, and I know that Suno in Hausa just means names. But in Yoruba, Suno means specifically Islamic names. Thus, when children were born, they were given Suno in lieu of or in conjunction with some Yoruba names. But people privileged the Islamic names because there was always this idea, the belief that on the day of heavenly judgment, Yorubas call it Ijo Ibende Alikiamo. On the day of heavenly judgment, we are told by the Muslim community that your Muslim name was the, the one by which each and every individual would be recognized and raised from the dead. And I remember asking many of my Muslim friends, do you think that God doesn't speak Yoruba? <laughs> Because Muslim converts, as much as Christians saw indigenous names as paganish, they did not need much motivation to move away from them. But like Christian converts, Muslims soon discovered secular Yoruba names, but a different set than those the Christians were using. For Muslims, it was the personal oriki that had the quality of not being tied to indigenous spirituality. The fact that it was Muslims and not Christians who first started to use Oriki names, these praise names that I've been talking about, for secular reasons, portrays the idea that praise names are more an Oyo Yoruba invention because Islam domiciled relatively much earlier in Northern Yoruba communities. Thus, Muslims availed themselves of an existing genre of names that was not available to the Christian community. Muslims discovered that Uriki are absolutely secular in that they make no reference to the deities. Uriki became very popular as first names, middle names, and surnames. Indeed, in established Yoruba Muslim communities in Lagos, Ilori, and so on, Oriki names are, are common as ordinary names and not as specialized names as they originally were. Islam influenced Yoruba names in other ways too. The pilgrimage to Mecca, which is one of the five pillars of Islam, has also generated a number of Yoruba language names, 
of which two are particularly striking, Abolore Ab and Abidemi. Abidemi, for example, is a name that is given usually when the father goes on a long journey whilst the mother is pregnant with the child. I have a brother called Abidemi and he was born in 1957. 1957 was the year that my father traveled to Europe. And by the time he came back, my brother has, had been born. And so he was given the name Abidemi. The same thing happens when Yoruba Muslims go to Mecca and the, the wife at home has a baby before they come. They have names like Abidemi. Abidemi is a name used to name boys or girls whose fathers have been away. So we can see the ways in which even Islam and Christianity have influenced Yoruba names and Yoruba naming systems. Let me conclude because it would be wonderful to hear your questions. Let me conclude in two ways. Or oh, I will leave one alone. I'll use the other conclusion. In my exposition of Yoruba names and naming practices, I began with the question of whether to gender or not to gender praise names. Such a question is clearly informed by colonization. Why must anything be gendered? Given that de gender division is a social contrivance with nothing inherent in the human condition about it as Yoruba culture shows. When we say a social practice or institution is gendered, we tend to think of it as his and hers and assume that it was gendered at its point of origin. Such an assumption works in a society where gender constructs are routine and the norm. In the Yoruba world, this is not the case. And therefore, the apparent gender of praise name does not constitute gender per se. The difference between current female associated names and male associated ones reflects a difference in the origin, origins of each set and not in the nature of the names or the function that they perform. The fact that ordinary non-Oriki names, Yoruba language names, continue to be used in a non-gendered manner, even in post-colonial society, would support the argument that Oriki names are intrinsically not gendered. Although the Yoruba have been pushed and pulled in many directions, over 300 years of history, creativity, and the rejection of gender categories remains an enduring aspect of their episteme. And I point to this most pointedly when you look at Yoruba Christian names. There are many Yoruba Christian names like Olufemi, Olushegun, Oluwada Milola, all those names today derive from some principle coming out of Christianity. And what is fascinating to me as a scholar of gender is that those names emanating from Yoruba Christian churches are still not gender specific, which is quite a curiosity given the gendered nature of Christianity and Christian practices. Yoruba names are varied and various, encapsulating a myriad of values and performing different functions. For this reason, instead of asking the question, what is in a name, as Shakespeare did, and I think it was in Romeo and Juliet, 
one might ask what is not in a name. And I remember years ago, I presented aspects of the, this work at the University of Botswana in Haberone. And when I asked the question, what is not in a name? Somebody from the audience replied. The answer to that question with regard to Yoruba is gender. Gender was not in Yoruba names. This study raises question about how, to, how we use gender as an analytical category. On what basis is gender attribution made to institutions and social practices? Practices, is it possible to think about gendering as a multi-layered process taking into account its very depth in time, among other variables? In many societies, gender categories remain epiphenomenal, even in the face of the current European and American-led male-dominant global system. I am wondering about the extent to which the taken for grantedness of gender typing and stereotyping globally reifies and promote gender binaries with all their negative power dynamics. Thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much, Professor Oyewumi. I hope I'm saying it correctly. But a very... You are trying it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's important. Yeah, so yeah, very, very interesting. And audience, it's time for questions and comments. You can write it in the Q&A section. We already have some questions there. You can go and look and see if you somebody also already raised their hand you can also raise your hand and be allowed to ask your question directly okay. so uh let's go with pelumi hello you can unmute Pelum pelumi Okay, let's try with Abdul. Abdul, you're unmuted. Yeah, my research uh, differed in terms of uh, the gendering of the names and the origin. Uh, I came in uh, rather late, so uh, my, my remarks might not be within the context. Uh, what I found out in the origin of the names is that uh, they're related to, they, they, were, they were in five categories. One has to do with uh, the totem of the family. The other one is has to do with the Uriki, which in ancient Egyptian, they call it Nebet. Uh, that's dealing with, uh, and Initially, it was the pharaoh that had all these names, these five names. So in ancient Egypt, there was a revolution, and all those names now were assumed by common people. Among Yoruba, there's four categories. Of the, four categories of those names became very prominent. But And the fifth one that I found was Aki, uh, which is uh, what produced the name Aki in Yoruba. And that one is referencing the notion of immortality. Um, so that was the research that I found. With respect to female names being uh, more like about uh, Kike names, Kike Po, they call it Kike Po, Aduke. There's a certain goddess in ancient Egypt called Anuket. She's a goddess of love. And I believe that that name originated. Um, those kicker names uh, came from that uh, that source because uh, with male is um, is always related to valor, and uh, with female is always related to love. Uh, 
I don't know. I uh, just uh, I, I want the my dear professor here with me Ronke, to just comment on that. Well, Abdul, how are you? I'm okay. Well, um, you are an Egyptologist, and as you know, I haven't studied enough of Egyptology. And even after studying it, one has to make a concrete link with Yoruba. And since I haven't read anything that has done that, I cannot comment further on what you've said. However, when you talked about a, god, a goddess of love and that the care, care names, the love cherished name, are associated with females. Is it only female children that are supposed to be loved? What is ironic about that is that in other parts of the world, we hear that people don't like female children. In fact, people talk about infanticide against female children. So it is a wonderful thing to have these names about cherishing in Yoruba. And I would challenge you to ask why it is that we would not love our sons. I don't know how, even if there was a female God who is associated with love, I don't know why her love would only stay with daughters. Look, yeah. Well, just... let's, let's have another question, please. Okay, can I just uh, make one more remark and then I'll hang up? Okay. Uh, just like in the other persuasion, the goddess of love is a, is a male in the Indo-European system, you know. So uh, does that mean that it's only men that are loved in uh, Valentine and women are not? So I'm not, it's just a question. So I would uh, give other people opportunity to talk also. Thank yeah, you. You're your question is totally out of context, so I cannot answer your question. But let me go Let me go to some of the written stuff here. Oh my, what happened to me? Open Zoom. Oh, we, we, we are seeing you and hearing you. Okay, cancel. Okay, yes, yeah, so uh, there are some questions here. There's, <laughs> jo there's one from Johnny Musumbu. How can we, as Africans recover and leverage knowledge that is so-called embedded in names to deal with monumental challenges that the continent is facing up against. Two responses. Our challenges on the continent are humongous. So it's not just one thing <laughs> that will solve the problem, but at a fundamental level, the naming question, as I understand it, is a variation on the language question. You know that big language question that Ngugi Wationgo wrote so eloquently about? And what is the naming question? What is the language question? Is the need to use our languages to access knowledge to, 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 to use our languages to on earth and appreciate our identity. For as long as African languages are secondary, are being erased, as long as we're not transmitting our names and our languages, so much is being lost. So it seems to me at the level of identity, the issue of naming and language is a good place to start. Is there any other raised hand? Hello, me. Okay. You're unmuted, Pelumi. You can ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Yeronke Yewumi. I am glad you are discussing Oriki today. Mm -hmm. And I'm also interested, I'm curious, you said that Yoruba name or Oriki names are not are not gendered. Um the name Ashake, for example, 
interestingly, about three days ago, I sent you an email about Ashake. Oh, it's yeah, you. Right? Yes, I'm going to me. reply. Yes. <laughs> and you are going to do what I want you to do for me with Ashake's music. Ololadi Ashake. I trust you will support me. Yeah. Um, Ololadi Ashake, for example, the name Ashake, for example, is a female name. But Ashake, the male musician, adopted the name. He explained that the name is his mother's name. So he adopted his mother's name as a stage name and it works for him. Sometimes some people think Ashake the musician is a woman until they encounter him and they realize he's a man. And some people have asked me why, why Ashake bears a female name while he's actually male. So I want to ask, what do you have to say about female Oriki names being answered by some male, some male performers, some male personalities, with the example of Oladi Ashake, the musician. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you're here because I'm going to reply <laughs> to your email. And I actually was thinking of starting with that question. The, the, fact, the fact that the musician Ashake chose his mother's name and is so comfortable in it, suggests to me that there isn't a, a, a huge psychological barrier in Yoruba society about gendered names. After all, his other name, as you just told me, his other name is Ololade, right? And Ololade is a name that is used by both male and female. Olushe, Gunfemi, Ronke, all our primary names are not gender specific. So I think it's actually ridiculous for somebody to be wondering why uh, somebody is using this name or that name. Perhaps I should also point out that in Yoruba society, Oriki, Oriki or praise names, personal praise names are not universal. There are large swaths of Yoruba land where people don't use Oriki. Oriki personal names are more associated with the Oyo. So if you think of all the parts of Yoruba society where they don't even have Oriki names, personal Oriki names, all the names that are on offer are non-gender specific. So at that level, I think that the, the, the question is almost redundant, if I may say so. Thank you. Can I take another question from the list here? Uh, anonymous attendee, I have not read a lot of your previous work, but wondering how do you distinguish between sex and gender in your work? Wonderful question. Wonderful question. 30 something years ago, or even 40 years ago, when women's studies was being instituted and in disciplines like sociology, when the category gender was being instituted and examined, the, 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 the proper thing to do at that time, we thought, was that there was a distinction between gender and sex. Sex was supposed to be the biological category and gender, the social constructs that are now mapped on to the biological category. However, by the time I came to do my work and by the time that uh, the philosopher Judith Butler wrote Gender Trouble, we had independently come to the conclusion that gender and sex are not separable in the way in which we had been made to understand. In Western society, even no matter how much you strip a body part, for example, 
no matter how much you strip it of any social associations, it still has those social associations. You cannot just look at a penis, for example, as an organ in the West and say, this is a penis. And I'm talking about it biologically. Immediately you say that it has phallic associations. It has associations of strength. It has associations of kingship. It has associations of power. That is why in my work, it is a fallacy, I think, to think that sex and gender are separable. In fact, they are more like synonyms. So I confronted that pro problem when I wrote The Invention of Women. I said that whether it's sex or whether it's gender, coming out of the West, it has a lot of social baggage. So I felt the need to invent or reinvent two new categories with which I wanted to talk about Yoruba society. So anybody who has read The Invention of Women know that I created two new categories anatomic male, anatomic female. I called it Anna male and Anna female. And the reason I created those pair was to, to, to sort of totally strip the words of the Western gender associations. Because I, I felt that I still needed to let people know that indeed in Yoruba society, we can recognize the anatomic differences, but without imposing a lot of baggage, social baggage on them. So that's how I dealt with it in my work. Okay, maybe we can let Solomon ask a question. Solomon, or go to yeah. the, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Are you hearing me? Yes, very well. Very, very good. I am Solomon Ochoa Oguro from Uganda. Mm -hmm. I come from the Luo Society, the Jupadola Luo Society. Nade, and we nade. Afoyo, be be Wingan. Good. <laughs> so um, you have tickled me with your research, Professor, because we have praise names in the Luo Society of Uganda, Eastern Africa. I'm wondering whether we're the ones who borrowed it from you or you borrowed it from us. <laughs> <laughs> History is uh, boundless in terms of space. But I think while you say that uh, the Yoruba people uh, have names, uh, what you call praise names with us, we call them park names. Park means to praise. They are gender specific in Uganda. For example, I'm Ochuo. The park name for Ochuo, or the Ariki name for Ochuo, is Odunga. And the one for, there is one called Nyasana. Nyasana is a park name for a female. Nyakona is a park name for a female. If I am Ochuo and then you call me Nyakona or Nyasana, people will laugh at me because you have changed my gender specificity. So uh, if in West Africa, among the Yoruba and I think among the Igbo and also among the, the Yopadola Luo in East Africa, we have praise names. Does it apply to the rest of Africa? Have you taken the chance to compare whether the Zulu, the Ewe, uh, or any other persons, uh, tribes, also have these park names? I know you have elaborated very well the origins, and I'm happy about that. And you are tickling me. I would like to find out more from my tribe as well, the group. 
<laughs> yes, go. that is my comment. Great question. You. you have to do your own studies. However, however, one of the big, big, <laughs> big, big, um, I want to say admonition that one makes when one writes a book or studies anything in Africa is to talk about specificity. You cannot just go to one African society and start generalizing from that one society across the continent. That has been one problem that pl plagued the studies of Africa. They treat Africa as if it's, it is one village. So when I wrote The Invention of Women, one of the things I emphasized is that I was studying Yoruba society. And Yoruba people are, are a huge group, 30 to 40 million people. They're they not a small group. Yet, I didn't feel that I could make a general statement about Africa and gender because I was better informed. For example, Hausa people in Nigeria, the language is gendered and I do speak Hausa, so I know. So there was no way I was going to overgeneralize the Yoruba thing to, to Hausa land without conducting research. When it comes to praise, I focused on praise names today, but there is praise poetry. And across the continent, there are different kinds of praise poetry. There are many societies where they have praise poetry, even in some parts of Yoruba land where they have praise poetry, but they don't necessarily have the very specific personal names. So I do know that in Zuli society, they have the Mbongi, which is a, a, a type of praise and lineage poetry. So I think all across the continent, you find some of these, these practices and institutions, but you have to look specifically at each institution. Perhaps I should also tell you that I know a thing or two about Luo names, of course, more names from Kenya, not Uganda. I know they are the same peoples. And what fascinated me when I first came across Luo names is that many Luo names encapsulated the idea of when the baby was born. So you have Luo names that would say, that would indicate that this child was born in the morning. Another one that says this child was born in the evening. I found that fascinating. What was it about morning and evening that made Luo people embed that in their names? Yoruba people didn't do that. All this to say, that is why it is important to study the huge variety of institutions, practices, cultures on the African continent. Let me take one last, I don't know, I don't know whether we have more time, but I'm going to take the question from Mo Mose Chikowero. Hello. He asks, culturally, who can call you Anike? I'm sure fleshing out the epistemic violence that Westernization, Islamization, and Christianization shorthand might require a whole separate lecture. No question. In Yoruba society, uh, Yoruba's practice what anthropologists, and I don't know whether it's correct, call name avoidance. People who are junior to me <laughs> are not supposed to call me by my first name. I'm sitting in my office. Students come every time and they want to call me by my first name and I tell them off in no uncertain terms. And as Yorubas like to say, if you were not there <laughs> when I was given this name, you have no right to call me by that name. A way of saying that if you are not my age or if you are junior to me, you can't just call me by my first name. And the same thing with Oriki. Anike, who will call me Anike? Those who are older than me, my parents. It's a way of, 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 of praising you, of showing how much you are loved. 
and it's usually from the senior to the junior. Of course, people can also use this in the boudoir <laughs> as a way of cherishing each other, no question. But only people who are your senior or your peers are allowed to call you by name. Thank you. So that was it. We are out of time. Thank you very much for a very fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you to the audience too for being here and asking questions. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.